Hi everyone, it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome you to this, the first ever of our virtual consultant sessions linked to YST's forum. What is a virtual consultant session? Over the last six months or so, during COVID, we, we've offered the opportunity to some of the younger faculty in YST to be mentored by people from elsewhere in the world who might otherwise have come to Singapore during this time. And the mentorship has been linked to projects that they would be taking forward in their research areas, lined, aligned with the uh, artistic research evolution which has been happening within the conservatory fields and beyond. The second thing that happened with COVID was that Singapore government offered some support for recent graduates to join us as teaching apprentices. And so some of the people who've been working with the virtual consultants have been not necessarily full-time, fully qualified academics, but are on a, on a journey of change. And the third group have been some people we've established in what we've been calling artist fellows. So they're working in the community in Singapore, but they're also working with us in YST and web evolution and growth. We've got four currently who are virtual consultants. Uh, there's uh, Topi Letipu, who's a tenor and a music consultant and festival director from Finland, uh, but basically currently living in the United Kingdom. There's Anna Tainitipun, who is uh, from the Princess Galeana Watana Institute in Bangkok, who's been looking at how we make our activities more relevant in the Southeast Asian context. There's Larry Dreyfus, who's a professor emeritus from a range of different schools around the world, currently resident in Berlin, a performer as well as an academic who's been working more on the teaching and learning approaches of the different people who, to whom he's been, with whom he's been working. And then there's Stephen Emerson, who's with us today for this first presentation, who's uh, a professor at the Queensland Conservatorium in Griffith University, but who's a performer, a pianist as well as academic, does lots of collaborative piano, solo piano, and has been very engaged with artistic research developments over the last 20 years. So Stephen, thank you first of all for doing this and for, for being the first on the journey. And to Xiang Ning and to Francis, thank you also for daring to take this presentation forward. Welcome to this, looking forward to your presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, firstly, could I just congratulate you and YST on this initiative, which I think is a, is a fabulous one to have that dialogue between institutions, between different countries. And from my point of view, it's, uh, it's been nothing but a pleasure to just have dialogue with these, these fabulous uh, uh, people uh, in, in your institution. Um, two of them today, it's just really quite wonderful uh, people to engage with, and I'm sure we're going to enjoy their presentations enormously today. Um, I think we, we start off with, with Francis and then move on to Xiang Ning and then there'll be an opportunity for us to have questions and some uh, shared dialogue after that. So I'm greatly looking forward to hearing the presentations. Thank you. I guess therefore it's over to you, Francis. Let's look, looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all so much for tuning in today. My name is Frances Lee, and I am a pianist and an instructor here in the Contextual Studies Department at YST. My presentation today is titled Unconventional, Hensel's Final Sonata, and I will be briefly sharing with you about a remarkable work that is very dear to my heart, Fanny Hensel's Sonata in G Minor. Please feel free to contribute questions in the chat during the presentation, and we will address them after the presentation is over. The takeaway of today's talk is that not only was Fanny Hensel unconventional in composing works that ventured outside of the domestic realm that was prescribed to her, but also that within her music, she was extremely unconventional in the way that she challenged structural expectations. 
By seeing Hensel's final sonata in the context of her life and other works, we can bring life to the formal organization of her compositions. This can enrich how we analyze, interpret, perform, and hear her music, and give us a much deeper understanding of her unique compositional voice. In this presentation, we will start with the big picture and then gradually zoom in. First, we will situate Hensel in her societal and historical context as a woman composer in the 19th century. Then we'll briefly present an overview of her oeuvre, hone in specifically on her multi-movement works and the sonata in G minor. And finally, focus in on the first movement of her sonata and conclude with a performance of it. Born in 1805, Hensel published under the name Fanny Hensel, geboren or born Mendelssohn Bartholdy. Her biography is a clear example of how societal forces dictate the reputation and reach of musical works and their composers. Despite her incredible talents from childhood as both a pianist and a composer, she did not have a significant public career unlike her brother Felix Mendelssohn. She was constrained by the societal norms and cultural expectations levied upon her due to her gender and her class intersecting. So as a woman from the upper class, she was expected to be a lady of leisure, cultivating her life in the domestic realm, but not out fostering a public career. This is in contradistinction to one of her contemporaries, Clara Wieck, later Clara Schumann, who was of a slightly lower social class, and therefore her going out and performing and composing was less frowned upon. Despite the challenges that Hensel faced, she still found outlets for her artistry. Not only did she compose a lot, she also performed, mostly in private settings, but on three occasions in public settings. Most significantly, she hosted a well-renowned musical salon at her residence. So these were semi-private settings where artists would mingle and perform and, and basically have a flourishing of artistic life. Encouraged by her husband, Wilhelm, she also started publishing volumes of her works in 1846, which was the penultimate year of her life. Prior to this, only a few of Hensel's leader had emerged in print. Some were anonymous and some were under her brother's name. Were it not for Hensel's sudden death by a stroke, she, she maybe would have preferred more compositions and would have had more published during her lifetime. The works that she did manage to see through publication are themselves indicative of societal constraints that were placed upon women composers in terms of the genres that they cover. Even though she wrote in a wide variety of genres, she only published in three of them, leader, short piano pieces, and part songs. The first two of these genres were considered appropriate for the private or domestic realm, and this is where we find most of Hensel's over. It is a testament to her talent and her creativity that she took this small prescribed space and just absolutely mastered it, found many ways to be innovative and creative, and really made her mark stylistically. Hensel did, however, write some larger scale works in genres that were considered to belong to the public realm. So these include cantatas and a single movement orchestral overture, as well as six multi-movement instrumental works. Three of these works are sonatas for solo piano, and three of them are works for chamber ensemble. The last of her chamber works is her piano trio in D minor, opus 11, which she composed in the last few years of her life. And the scholar Larry Todd believes that she eventually intended to publish this work. So we can maybe think of this piano trio with a more public-facing intention in mind. This is as opposed to her piano sonata in G minor, which was written a few years earlier in autumn of 1843, which was before she ventured into publishing. The G minor sonata is the last of the three complete piano sonatas that are still surviving. And unlike the earlier sonatas, it was written in the years after she returned from a life-changing trip to Italy in 1839 and 1840. Not only was she absolutely inspired by the art and culture that she encountered on her travels, but during their extended stay in Rome, she was really adored by all the artists and musicians that were in her circle, and in particular by a young French composer by the name of Charles Gounod. This trip had a positive impact on her compositional output, and in the following year, when she returned to Germany, we saw works such as her phenomenal piano cycle, Das Jahr, or The Year. A few months before Hensel wrote this G minor sonata, in April and May of 1843, Gounod visited Hensel in Berlin. And she recorded in her diary that, quote, his presence was a very lively musical stimulus for me, for I played a lot and had many discussions with him about music, end quote. So perhaps interacting once again with such a fervent admirer of hers was the encouragement that Hensel needed 
both to return to the genre of the piano sonata after many years, and also to boldly explore new ways of interacting with sonata form and challenging the expectations of its structure. Tenzel aims for structural cohesion among the four movements of the sonata. Similar to what she does in her piano cycle last year, she has the work proceed uninterrupted, and she asks for all the movements to be played ataka, with transitory passages that modulate in both key and character from one movement to the next. So for example, the end of the first movement is immediately followed by horn calls that usher in the dance-like second movement, as you will hear here. The horn call also plays an important harmonic purpose here, functioning as the pivot and the co common tone between G major and B minor by outlining the pitch B. So this reinforces another way in which the sonata is held together, that is, its large-scale tonal teleology, or the way in which all the movements seem to drive towards its end goal. The prevailing tonic pitches of the movements ascend an arpeggio, G, B, D, and G, and thus spell out G major which is the key of the last movement and the final goal of the work. Another way for us to visualize the tonal trajectory of the sonata is by means of a tone nets or tone network diagram. This is a system that emerged in the 1980s from the combination of ideas from German harmonic treatises in the 19th century and 20th century transformational theory. This visually represents triads and common tone relationships and we find it particularly helpful when we want to map out chromatic moves that were really popular in the 19th century. So here we have the G minor triad in a downward pointing triangle with G, B flat, and D at its points. And then the parallel major, G major, is the upward pointing triangle directly above it and with G, B, and D at its points. Spelling out the G major arpeggio involves situating the second movement in the unusual key of B minor, which is not diatonic to the key of G minor. More typical or common choices for inner movements in a G minor work would be the relative major of B flat major or the subdominant and dominant minors, C minor and D minor. B minor is, however, diatonic to G major, and so we can see the use of this tonality in the second movement as a sign that points us toward the G major finale. So this supports the teleological drive of the sonata. This is further reinforced by the use in the third movement of the key of D major instead of D minor, which then allows the audience to hear the entire third movement as the dominant chord of G major that resolves when we finally get to the last movement. The sonata's unconventional large-scale tonal trajectory is already telegraphed within the first movement, to which we will now turn. On first listen, this movement might strike the audience as just a straightforward alternation of two main ideas that progress through a series of different keys. So the first idea is bold, disjunct, and chordal. The second idea is lyrical and flowing. However, if we take into account two things, one, that the prevailing expectations at the time was for opening movements of sonatas to have a structure that we have come to call sonata form, and two, that Hensel was clearly well-versed in this construction and convention, as you can see from her other works, then we will find that it's incredibly fruitful to see this first movement through the lens of sonata form norms, and we can unfold how Hensel works with and defies audience expectations. So what would the audience typically expect to hear? Here I'll proceed off the conception of sonata theory by James Hebikoski and Warren Darcy. Conventional sonata forms are thought of in three large sections. 
The exposition is where we are introduced to the thematic material of the sonata, and we go from the tonic key to a new key. The development is where we explore this material, wander through different keys, and eventually wind our way back to the tonic. And the recapitulation is where we revisit the events of the exposition, but this time we stay in the tonic key. We will use the first movement of Hensel's D minor piano trio to illustrate how sonata form expositions usually work. Now, this movement is itself very unconventional in many ways, but the sections are clearly differentiated and the function of each theme is very easy to identify. One wonders if Hensel maybe had potential publication on her mind when she wrote this piece, and maybe this contributed to her slightly more normative approach to sonata form, as opposed to her much more experimental sonata. The trio's exposition opens with the first or primary zone, P. Themes in the primary zone, or P themes, normally have a tight-knit structure, such as a period in which an opening phrase is answered by a closing phrase, or a sentence in which an opening idea is developed and drives towards a cadence. Here is the beginning of the piano trio's P theme. expanded period which eventually cadences with cascading quaver chords on the piano, which is a clear break from the rolling semiquavers beforehand. The tight-knit nature of the P theme is usually contrasted with the transition section, which is the next section in sonata form, TR. This TR zone is usually more loosely organized and acts as a bridge. So we start in the tonic key and we get brought into the new key, often with the use of sequences. For a minor mode piece, this new key is most often the relative major. So here is the beginning of the transition in the piano trio. usually a clear break in the texture to signal that something new is about to happen, which we call the medio cesura or MC. This allows us to easily recognize the start of the second or secondary zone, S. S themes typically also have tight-knit structures with clear beginnings and ends. Here is the end of the transition in the piano trio and the beginning of the secondary theme. The texture thins out and the harmonic rhythm slows down to herald the entry of the new melody in the cello, which is accompanied by tremolo figures in the piano. S zone, we usually have a perfect authentic cadence, which is a particularly definitive dominant to tonic chord progression. This cadence confirms that we have settled in the new key and provides what we call an essential expositional closure, or EEC. This is then followed by concluding material in the closing zone, C, that allows us to bask in this new tonality. However, in the piano trio, Hensel throws a spanner in the works. Instead of letting this F major S theme cadence and give us the EEC, she employs what we call a trimodular block construction. This F major S theme turns into a second transitional passage, and we then have a second medial caesura, breaking the flow of the piece, followed by a new S theme in the parallel F minor. The second medial caesura in the piano trio is marked by the sudden disappearance of the tremolo figures of the first S theme, and then the second S theme is accompanied by a return of the full texture. minor S theme then does give us a definitive cadence of the essential expositional closure and cleanly demarcates, is, it's cleanly demarcated as both the harmonic rhythm and the textural density abates, as you can hear here. Despite the 
unexpected structural twists and turns of the piano trio, the audience is able to easily follow along with help of these textual cues, even as Hensel undermines our initial assumption that the first S theme will lead to a definitive cadence in a relative major. In the G minor sonata, however, Hensel pushes much further in how she wants to challenge her listeners. This time she undermines their assumptions of which theme they're going to hear, or which zone they are in at all. In trying to understand how the, ex the movement is put together, it's useful to consider the concept of retrospective reinterpretation. This is a concept expounded upon by Janet Schmalfeld in her phenomenological study of the music of Schubert and others. Retrospective reinterpretation deals with how our sense of structure morphs as we listen to the piece. So for example, we could perceive the first event of the piece to be an introduction, but as we continue to listen to the piece, and this first idea takes on more meaning, more weight, and is developed further, we are forced to reevaluate our initial designation and realize that what we heard was actually the primary theme proper, even if it didn't seem so at the time. In this way, retrospective reinterpretation attempts to replicate the actual lived experience of a work as it progresses in time, rather than viewing it on the page in its entirety and being able to make judgments based on our foreknowledge of what comes next. Hensel re invites re retrospective reinterpretation in the first movement of the sonata through the ambiguous thematic identity or function of the second main melodic idea. And the structure of the movement is further obscured by its mercurial harmonies and unusual tonal trajectory. Throughout the movement, Hensel has the listener constantly questioning if they are in a typical sonata structure, and if so, where they are within it. The bold opening idea that you heard earlier functions relatively normatively as a P theme. It has a periodic structure, and it ends with a clear cadence in G minor, which sounds like this. has concluded, we assume that the lyrical quaver melody that follows next is the transition section that delivers us into the new key. As is typical of transition sections, it's harmonically unstable, with the melodic idea repeated numerous times in different keys, so it doesn't parse easily into a tight-knit theme structure. So, so far, so good. But instead of leading us to an already obvious medial season break and into a new S theme, we are led back to the beginning of the P theme, and now in the unusual non-diatonic key of D minor. initially reason this away as a reusing of material. Perhaps Hensel is following the model of Haydn, where with this monothematicism that he does, his secondary themes often begin similarly to his primary themes. So in that case, what we have here would actually be the S theme, and consequently, the next significant harmonic event that we should hear is a strong cadence that confirms B minor as our new key area. However, Hensel defies this expectation too. Not only is there no cadence, but a mere six measures later, we are launched into a return of the lyrical melody presented over the dominant of A minor in totally new harmonic territory. This then throws our assessment of the B minor return into question as well. Perhaps it isn't the exposition's S theme after all. But what then is the lyrical melody's role here? Without giving too much away now, the rest of the movement continues to play with these structural ambiguities. And our understanding of the identity and function of each thematic idea continues to shift and evolve over the course of the movement. We eventually retrospectively reinterpret this B minor return as the beginning of the development section. And together with that, we realize that the lyrical melody functions as both a transitional material and a secondary theme. This lyrical melody, which I thus refer to as TRS, is a remarkable not just in its emergent dual function, but also in how Hensel uses its first appearance to present a microcosm of the tonal journey of the entire sonata. We mentioned earlier that Hensel avoids the conventional tonal destinations for a G minor work. Instead, she is much more interested in exploring a tonal region that we know as the Weizmann region. 
Here we have the G minor triad and a downward pointing triangle. And if we extend diagonally both sides from B flat and D, we get the augmented triad of G flat, B flat, and D, which continues to recur along the same line in its enharmonic forms. If we now include the triads around it, jutting out from it like teeth, we get the Weichmann region, the six chords that are only one semitone away from this augmented triad. So these are G minor, B minor, and E flat minor. And their relative majors, B flat major, D major, and G flat or F sharp major. So we have keys that are spaced a major third apart from each other with their relative modes. One of the most fascinating and unconventional things about this sonata is that even though B flat major is the most normative and expected tonal destination for a sonata in G minor, Hensel gives it relatively little attention as a stable thematic key. Instead, she often uses it in a dominant capacity as the gateway to the actual destination of E flat minor, which has a much more significant presence in the work. In fact, all three of the major triads of this Weizmann region are often used in the sonata as gateways to the three minor triads and much less often as destinations in their own right. F-sharp major acts as the dominant of B minor, which is the key of the second movement. And while D major is the key of the third movement, Hensel undercuts the triad stability as a tonic with a conspicuous absence of root position D major triads throughout the movement, thereby emphasizing its transitory role as a large scale dominant to the G major of the last movement. In the first TRS section of the first movement, Hensel essentially gives us an introductory tour through these tonal spaces and moves that govern the whole sonata. I'm now going to play this TRS section while plotting out the moves on the tone nets so that you can follow along on the screen. By peeling back the surface of the music and unfolding the intricacies of its construction, we can better appreciate how Hensel was truly unconventional, not just in the kinds of music that she wrote, but also in what she did within each piece. Looking at depth at a work such as the Sonata, especially in comparison to her piano trio, also makes us wonder about how publishing considerations may have had significant impacts on how adventurous and boundary pushing composers were comfortable to be particularly for Hensel, given the challenges she already had to face as a woman composer in the 19th century. It's incredible to consider how much Hensel managed to pack into a mere 16 minutes of music in the sonata. And it's even more incredible to think that it never got published during her lifetime. We might not even have known it existed if researchers in the 20th century hadn't found it. So when it takes almost one and a half centuries for brilliant works like these to be published and performed, it really makes one wonder if a musical canon is all it's cracked up to be, and if it might not be worth challenging canonicity and exploring outside of the canon and our traditional repertory to give great works a chance to be heard and to give ourselves a chance to discover something new. Now I will perform the first movement of the sonata, and I encourage you to follow the journey of the two main ideas, the bold and the lyrical, throughout the piece. You might find that the movement ends somewhat abruptly since, as we know, it's supposed to go uninterrupted into the next movement.
If you would like to hear how this sonata continues, you can find my recording of the entire sonata at francisleepiano.com slash recordings. And the link is also on the web page that advertises this forum. There are, of course, many great recordings out there as well. Thank you all so much for being here to listen and watch today. And I hope that this encourages you to peer more closely at how music is put together, to find unconventionality in the works that we might not hear so often, and to just really challenge canonicity in music. Thank you all so much. Well, thank you, Francis, very much. That's a very stimulating presentation. I'm sure we've got lots of comments and questions we'd like to discuss, but we might uh, postpone those till after Zhang Ning's presentation, and then we can open the, open the forum up to wider discussion. So over to you, Zhang Ning. All right, let's take a look. It was the summer of 2020. And I was thinking, hmm, which composer should I now explore? So I rang my teacher and called some friends. Somehow, everyone suggested Ravel. So Mirwa joined the plan. But to leave room for more repertoire, I selected Oiseau Triste and Umbach Solution. And to the other three movements, whispered, pardon. I recall Umbach's solution from Call Me By Your Name. Those shivering arpeggios tickled my senses, much like the main character's cute glances. But on the other hand was Oiseau Triste, delicate like fine china that could pulverize in the hands of a clumsy bearer. Having not played much of Ravel, it felt like I needed a way, a sign, an entry point to show me how his world and mine could join. What to do, I thought. My mind's counsel I besought. Ah, perhaps for a sensing of impressionism, I'll piece Van Gogh while listening to Chamayo and on the side read tons of Ravel bio. Or perhaps I should introspect to have my mind straight before my hands react. Since wassel trees means sad birds, what meaning lies behind those words? Was Ravel expressing his sadness, hence he, the sad bird? Why was he, all the birds, lonely and downhearted? What does sadness mean to me? Should I find out how it feels to be a bird? Hello everybody and welcome to my forum presentation. The sequence that you just saw is basically a reenactment of the thoughts that were going through my head when I was trying to figure out a way into approaching Ravel's music. Being relatively inexperienced in performing his works, I was looking for a point of entry into the world of Wazo Triste. What inspired me greatly were these two quotes I found of Ravel. First, the aesthetic of Edgar Allan Poe your great American has been of singular importance to me. Second quote, as for technique, my teacher was certainly Edgar Allan Poe. The finest treatise on composition, in my opinion, and the one which in any case had the greatest influence upon me, was his philosophy of composition. I am convinced that Poe indeed wrote his poem, The Raven, in the way that he indicated. So after reading those two quotes, I thought, huh, who is Edgar Allan Poe? What is the essay Philosophy of Composition about? And why have I never heard Poe's name mentioned in relation to Ravel's? Edgar Allan Poe was an American poet born two generations before Ravel. The Philosophy of Composition was Poe's analysis of his creative process behind writing The Raven, one of his most famous poems. The process he outlined is extremely methodical and formulaic. He recalled and explained the rationale behind every single consideration. So I thought, since we rarely have access to a composer's direct references in approach, this could be the point of entry that I was searching for. It didn't take long, too, to notice the uncanny mirroring in terms of subject and tone between The Raven and Wazoo Triste. Both are deeply melancholic and feature a bird. 
If Ravel admired Poe's treatise and saw pedagogical value in it, could he have applied it to the composition of Oiseau Trees? In the 1928 lecture, Ravel emphasized on the importance of recognizing two levels of consciousness in the process of understanding one's artistic identity, lineage, and belonging. The first is the national consciousness, which is more outward looking, relating oneself to contemporaries and broader aesthetics. The second is individual consciousness, which is more inward looking. So, on that note, how did an American from two generations before Ravel come to play such a central role in his aesthetic approach? Poe was actually not well received by his American contemporaries and ironically had a much larger following one generation later in France. By the time Ravel was a teenager, Poe had already earned a high regard amongst French literary circles. Many of his works were translated and championed by admirers such as Baudelaire, who is arguably the father figure of modern French artistic expression. Baudelaire's translation of Poe's Philosophy of Composition, published in 1859, is the version that Ravel read. Through this tracing, we see how the influence of Poe on French aesthetics in the wider sense trickled down to shaping Ravel's individual consciousness. One of the earliest acknowledgments of Ravel's respect for Poe's works dates from 1892. At that time, Ravel was 17 and attending Paris Conservatoire. One day, he showed Ricardo Vignes, a good friend of his, whom he later dedicated Oiseau Triste to, two dark and somber drawings that he had sketched based on two of Poe's short stories, A Descent into the Maelstrom and MS Found in a Bottle. According to Vinay's, Ravel read widely, and Poe was one of the central sources. Growing up, Ravel loved mathematics and was fascinated with automobiles, hence he displayed a strong inclination towards methodical and mechanical constructions. Moreover, his popular image is that of an emotionally reticent and meticulously groomed man. It is perhaps not surprising then that Ravel found such a passage from Poe highly conducive. It is my design to render it manifest that no one point in its composition is referable either to accident or intuition, that the work proceeded step by step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem. At this point, you may be thinking, okay, I see how Ravel and Poe relate to each other philosophically, but how do different literary and musical forms correspond to each other, and can they? Ravel once said, for me, there are not several arts, but only one. Music, painting, and literature differ only in their means of expression. He goes on to say that when beholding Manet's Olympia, he perceives the same essence as when listening to Shabria's melancholy, and it is as though the same impression is transferred to another medium. Adding on to this point, Ravel talks about the relation between inner manifestation and outward expression. When two artworks share the same artistic impulse and philosophy, in other words, the same inner manifestation, this similarity in their outward expression would only be due to other personal variables. Coming back to Ravel and Poe, though one is a poet and the other a composer, what is striking is their philosophical alignment, the correspondence of an inner manifestation that transcends the boundaries of artistic forms. There is a great difference between Ravel and Poe, though, and the next clip will hint to why. Sometimes, in the most frustrating moments of our practice, don't we wish that the composer issued some sort of manual along with the score? Ravel, oh Ravel, why do you refuse to provide any sort of analysis? 
you weren't so reluctant to analyze your music, so reticent about your process, well, I'd probably be having a much easier time now. But when a composer, or in the case of Poe, the writer, actually dishes out an entire analysis detailing each step of his thought process, pointing out each bolt and part, some might actually say, okay, hold up. That can't be all true. You're making it up. And that's exactly what happened with the reception of Poe's philosophy of composition. Some critics thought that he just made it up. And because Poe sounded like he was taking pride in his ability to so vividly recount every detail and every consideration, well, some, those critics, quite understandably, thought that he was just tooting his own horn. But what's more important to us here and now is that Ravel defended the validity of Poe's work. So from that, we can see how Ravel not only values it, but he sees visibility in it. So what does this outline entail? Poe talks about eight main considerations. Extent, effect, tone, pivot, climax, rhythm and meter, locale, and denouement. Rather than looking too much further just at the eight points, I want to apply them and illustrate them through Wazo Triste. First, extent. Poe first considers the length, or in his words, the extent of the work. He realizes that in order to ensure the unity of impression, the work must be suitably consumed in one seating. Hence, brevity is key and it must be in direct ratio to the intensity of the effect, which we'll get to it shortly. So in terms of length, the Raven has 108 lines, which takes less than 10 minutes to read. Wazo Trees has 32 bars, which takes around 4 minutes to play. In relation to a 3-hour opera or a 500-page novel, both works are indeed very brief. Next. Effect. So, what effect was Poe talking about when he said that brevity must be in direct ratio to the intensity of the effect? He believes that what's found in the contemplation of the beautiful surpasses truth and passion in impressing upon the soul. So, beauty is his chosen effect. Then he goes on to ask, through which tone would beauty reach its highest manifestation? To him, it was sadness, which excites the sensitive soul to tears. Now, I'm giving myself goosebumps at this point because the mirroring between that and how Ravel literally titled his piece Sad Birds is, is spooky. Ravel also adds that the piece evokes birds lost in the topper of a very dark forest during the hottest hours of summer. Ravel sets us up for this poetic experience of sadness right from the start. It begins with this static and lonesome bird call. A glimpse of activity. falling back to stasis. And this is when you start to notice the dark forest enshrouding. It's thick textures and pungent sonorities. It feels really oppressive. And this is when you think Ah, uh, this is where and why the birds are entrapped. Moving on to Pivot. When thinking through the structure of Raven, Poe thought that he needed something upon which everything could turn, or in other words, a tool to gel everything together. He chose the refrain. It's such a funny word, isn't it? Because it means both to hold back and to repeat. Well, in this case, it means to repeat. The repetition provides a binding force, and when applied with variation, 
the monotony of repetition would be avoided. In Raven, the refrain is the word nevermore, spoken by the bird at the end of each stanza. In Wazo Triste, the core of the refrain is heard in that two note motive from the earlier example. Let's hear it now in its first variation. hear it two more times, each time tinged with a different hue of sadness. The refrain and its interspersing episodes in both Raven and Wazoo Trees lead towards a climax. In Raven, given that the poem develops over an increasingly intense exchange of queries from the lover and the raven's one-word reply, nevermore. The climax would be where the pairing of the query and the reply would invoke the greatest amount of despair. So near the beginning, the lover is still asking, will I ever be freed from my memories of Lenore? Quoth the raven, nevermore. By the climax, he cries out, tell me in paradise, is there a radiant maiden named Lenore? Quoth the raven, nevermore. In Wazoo Triste, the climax is not actually during the point of highest dynamic intensity, but after that. Hence, it's more like an anticlimax. And here's how it sounds. So why do I still consider this the climax? Well, if there is a force to counter sadness and oppressiveness, and especially the build-up of those two, it would be the liberation from them. And this is where a sense of liberation is quite literally written into the music. We see these sprawling figures and it takes a while to notice that the three systems actually all belong to one bar. Ravel labels this whole episode as presque et libre, which means with freedom. And this arabesque motif is a variation of the refrain that we heard at the beginning. And so this bird song sings and flutters down from the highest pitches of the piece. And this episode follows on from the second last manifestation of the refrain not unlike the raven. Moving on to rhythm and meter, which are important considerations when one tries to write poetry. So Poe claims no innovation in any particular meter, but his innovation lies in the combination of meters. One could perceive the same effect in Wazoo Triste. While the refrain always appears in the same rhythm, the episodes contrast. The first episode, which you've heard, is grounded in triplets. The second episode has a triplet-duplet figure within the triplets, which already adds more movements. And then it morphs into quadruplets within triplets, before going on to the final episode, which is in the climax that you heard just now. which has even more movement. So one may ask, what's the purpose of all these contrasting rhythms and meters? What does it do to the piece? What does it do for the piece? Well, I think it is precisely this choreography that alternates between you know, the still and sorrow refrains and these rapid movements in search for escape and light that renders the 
final return to the refrain, just more achingly sad. Seven, the locale. This is probably the most straightforward consideration. Poe says that a closed and restricted space is necessary to provide strength in framing the content. It is easy to hear the darkness and topper of the forest in these episodes, where the texturally and rhythmically intertwined lines suggest the twisted and interlocked branches of trees obscuring light. Lastly, the denouement. It comes after the climax, where all materials are resynthesized. But if it's just that, it'd be rather dull. Poe specifies that there must be a sense of the story transcending the real, hence offering complexity. While there is comfort in hearing familiar materials synthesized, there is also an allure that leaves things hanging. This is the dinamon where the refrain is heard one last time. It's repeated three times in plain fashion. it bleeds into silence. And not only does sadness feel inevitable, it's now ever more entrapped in an internal suspense.
Well, what a pity we don't have time for actual applause there. <laughs> two, two wonderful presentations and certainly performances that are deserving of, of, of great appreciation, if not in uh, uh, real real applause. Um, thank you both. What a, what a pleasure to hear such, oh, well, both of them very <laughs> fine presentations, but in so many ways, uh, beautifully complimentary. Um, I suppose, um, it, firstly, I loved the, the, the visual way both of you used that the, 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 um, the, the visual side to clarify your points, whether that's in a poetic sense or in a, in a, in a purely uh, you know, logical sense to underline your points. I thought mm -hmm. that was uh, quite, quite terrific. Um, I also was was very much impressed with the the way in which uh, both of you were able to integrate your piano uh, illustrations within your talk because I think any one of us who's tried to do that has always found that a real challenge. Um, I wonder if you could each say a few words about about how you you find that experience because um, f for many of us it's a bit of a different part of our brain that we use to articulate our words mm -hmm. from what we do when we're playing the, the, the piano. Could, could you each say a few words about that for me, please? Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead first? <laughs> Stephen, sorry, do you mean um, when we're doing the presentation or do you mean the application of, um, you know, theories and research to playing in general? I, I, I would I would love in fact you to talk about both of those I, w I was meaning more in terms of the, the when you're actually giving the presentation right. and then I was going to move on to that next point after that in <laughs> fact because I think that's the other really interesting point is what you take from the uh, all of this wonderful exploration mm -hmm. and investigation of context and ideas that mm -hmm. shape your performance and how that takes shape in a performance I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on both of those, if possible. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was definitely a difficulty to switch channels, you know, from speaking to playing. But there is also something very stimulating about hearing yourself saying the thoughts or the idea out loud once more before you go into mm -hmm. playing, which in like it, it's, it's, it feels different. Mm -hmm. It feels fresh when you play again and when you demonstrate. And it helps that it's just a small portion every time the demonstration. Yeah, so I think there's like this active transference of ideas uh, going into yeah. it. I love that idea of uh, mm. making it fresh. Yeah. That actually that our ideas refresh our response to how we we make sound and draw out the sort of imagery that we're, we're wanting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How are your thoughts on, on that, Francis? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with Xiangling about the transition between playing and speaking. It really does seem to involve totally different parts of your mentality. And yes. Xiangling really hats off to like doing that from memory. It's just incredible to me. Um, yeah, I think like for me, it, it helps a lot to just have the music there. I could maybe do it without, but it's just, you know, when you find yourself not talking anymore and kind of going into performance mode, I think it's just helpful to have this kind of visual stimulus for me. But yeah, I mean, to Xiangling's point about kind of articulating for yourself and like, or what you're saying, making what you're playing fresh, I think sometimes when we do get into performance mode, especially when we're learning a new piece and we're excited to kind of sight read and blast our way through the piece, that sometimes we just treat it as more notes coming up. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're actually talking about the piece and sectionalizing it and thinking about the significance of each part within the whole, and then you directly address it before you mention it, then it kind of frames it in a different way for you right before you play it, which I think is helpful. And then maybe this segues us into the second point that Xiangnin brought up, um, or the second question, about how, yeah, how, how the research that we've done kind of informs the way we play. So at near the end of my presentation, before I played a whole movement, to have to change the slides to reflect the harmony as I'm playing kind of I mean, there is a whole rehearsal process for this that haven't, obviously, but it also kind of makes you really think about the harmony pri primarily when you're doing it, because mm -hmm. I have to think, okay, now my foot goes down again, right? And when you're playing through the piece, you are thinking about a lot of other things at the same time, right? And you kind of just get immersed in how your fingers are moving, how the melody is leading you, but to exclusively focus on that, 
on that particular aspect of the music while still balancing all these other things you have to do to make it musical was a really enlightening experience for me, I think. Yeah, and I, I think you both expressed that, that that beautifully because you know it, it, it is a, a a challenge, but as you say, it it just um, gives us a, a sense of focus as well as obviously uh, enhancing the the listener's experience very um, meaningfully. So thank you very much for that. Um, now we do have some some questions coming in, so I will just uh, uh, read those out. And the the first one is from Yongen Wong. And this is to, to Dr. Lee. Uh, it says, uh, thank you for a thorough and meaningful analysis of the sonata. And I absolutely concur with that. <laughs> I'd like to hear some elaboration on the effect of publishing and possibly other societal constraints on Hensel's music. Could you say a little bit about that, Francis, please? Yes, and thank you so much, Yongen, for your question. Um, I think it's easiest if I structure this from, like, talking about the piano trio, like zooming out a bit and then talking about her and uh, about Hensel in general. So with the piano trio, actually there is another sign that she was maybe thinking about publishing when she worked on the trio. She has six multi-movement works and the previous five before the piano trio all have a skirt in them, a skirt of movement. Um, and when it got to the piano trio, she wrote a kind of song-like, lead-like piece instead. And her son, Sebastian, actually wrote to Felix saying, Mother thinks that she shouldn't write a skirzo, but please tell her to write a skirzo because if she doesn't, people will think she can't write a skirzo. And yeah, I mean, just the fact that she clearly did write a lot of skirzi was very comfortable doing it, but just not when she was writing something that maybe was public facing, I think kind of reveals that she did have some concerns about how it would look like if she had written one, right? Like that maybe she thought writing in a lead like style would be more appropriate and more palatable to people who are receiving her music as a woman composer. Mm -hmm. um, with the other things that she published, two of the, the leader for piano that she published that I, I enjoy playing actually both have kind of hidden titles. So one, one is originally from her piano cycle, Dacia, and it was titled September. And, it, and each movement in Dacia comes with a little epigram. So some of it is like a chorale a quote from a chorale, some of it is, are just little poet, excerpts of poetry that either her husband wrote or other people wrote. And so the one for September talks about like, flow, flow, dear river, and never will I be happy. And so she has all this kind of programmatic, or maybe not programmatic, but this depictive intent in the piece. But when she published it, it was just Opus 2, number 2. She, she left that out. And then in another piece, she also had this kind of connection to a Goethe poem that she also left out. So I'm not sure if I'm allowed to kind of make assumptions on that, but maybe she was also trying to remove these personal, you know, significances from her when she was putting it out in this public realm so people didn't think that she was, I don't know, just putting out personal stuff. And then in terms of societal constraints in general, most of the time people point to this kind of specific moment, I think when she was 14 or somewhere in her teenage years, when she and Felix were both learning music, like assiduously, they were learning how to compose, they were learning how to play, and at a certain point, her father told her that while music can be the Grundfass, like the fundamental base of Felix's life, for you it must only be a theater or like a decoration. So she was using these musical terms to tell her, actually, you shouldn't make it into your career because it's not appropriate for someone of your social class. So that, I think, put a big damper on her career. And then people tend to talk about how even after her father died, Felix kind of continued to not be very encouraging of her publishing um, aspirations and some of that was not necessarily just because he was like um, trying to preserve the status quo I think some of that was out of her protective instinct because to him if you venture into the public world with publishing then you were subject to all this criticism and she didn't really want her to be kind of involved in all of that but he I think he did say to his mother but not directly to Fanny that if she decided to publish I won't stop her or, or like I'll help I think he just couldn't find it in himself to actually encourage her. So I think not having, and they were very close siblings, so not having the support of someone who was that important to her, I think put a big damper on how she wanted to portray herself as a musician in society. Yeah. So mm. that's my very long answer. <laughs> I apologize. No, it's, it's an ex ex excellent answer covering many, many things there. Um, but j just back, back one step, I, I find that really interesting, that thought that there were all sorts of 
rather secret programmatic implications in that music which were not made public. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, um, it just strikes me as very interesting comparison with Clara Schumann and Robert and Clara are both, you know, put lots of those secret mm -hmm. little messages into their music. I wonder if, 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 if Annie was putting it in there to some extent as a form mm -hmm. of communication to uh, perhaps Felix or to others who were close to her who would understand her meaning. I wonder if, if the similar sort of thing applied there. I'm not sure about those two particular pieces that I talked about. I think, I mean, the the September piece from the piano cycle had a lot of personal connections with her husband, but definitely throughout a lot of her repertoire, for example, if Felix is writing something, then sometimes she would make musical references in like quoting little things mm -hmm. in her music. So in the string quartet, I believe, she quotes things that Felix was writing in his Music, uh -huh. or or uh -huh. that they no, or that they both referred to like the same. No, sorry, Fanny <laughs> was quoting parts of Felix's song. So yeah, there there are these little musical references inside for sure as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, mm -hmm. it's a lo lovely little side to romantic music. I mean, I think it's there in Brahms as well. That that mm -hmm. those that that public face and that very intimate sharing and communication that goes on in the background. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we, we might move on, we've got a few more questions here. Um, we've got one here uh, from Vanessa, and this is regarding um, Zhang Ning's presentation there. Uh, the question is, um, do you feel that Poe and Ravel's philosophy of methodical mm -hmm. composition translates to performance? How might it affect how you practice reciting or performing their poems or pieces? And this, this strikes me as a, as a really important question. You know, it's lovely to have that contextual stuff, but how it actually translates into the, the act of performance mm -hmm. is, is not a simple <laughs> direct correlation at all. Do, do you want to have a go at um, sure. answering that one? Thank sure. you. Hi, Vanessa. So um, I think that that's definitely something that was very much on my mind throughout this whole process of um, investigating this topic. I think it, so you know, before the performance, even taking a few steps back to working through and understanding, unpacking each of the points that, you know, I talked about regarding Poe's process, I had to go to the piano. And I think everything has to start from the score and the sound, like from the instrument, more than from an abstract point, because some things may make sense logically but when you go to this instrument you can't hear it and you can't apply it then I think it's a bit problematic what worked for me is that when I went back to the sound to my relationship with the sound and how I thought about the music the points transferred to me and it changed my understanding of the structure like just compositionally the structure of the piece because I never thought of it as the refrain and in fact these refrains that I now see um, I didn't quite hear like the pattern of it in the same way that I did um, before I was you know when I was practicing this piece without the knowledge of Poe's uh, philosophy of composition and also it made me think more about if this is a puzzle what does each of the pieces mean and contribute to the picture? So I wasn't also thinking about like episodes and you know the change in rhythm and meter. It felt more like a, oh the sound is changing or you know oh there's like increased momentum in the piece. But I wasn't really thinking why. I think the the value of you know applying something a, a philosophy or treatise that is not necessarily based. In, in music are not written by a musician is that you test to see if some thoughts are transferable to another mm -hmm. medium and sometimes it, it it draws out and it illuminates another way of seeing that we don't necessarily see when we apply you know our knowledge of musical forms mm -hmm. because there's no musical form that that I can think of off the top of my head now that necessarily mirrors what Poe is talking about in his philosophy of composition. You don't really, we don't usually look at pieces like this. So it's just literally through a different lens. Um, 
And I think maybe, and I understand that maybe when you heard the final performance, you know, you don't really go in your head like listing out the eight points. And that's not the point. That's not the point. I think I th maybe, you know, the performer or the researcher has more to gain in that sense uh, of all these processes when, when they're performing it. But the great thing is that you get, we get to now share our process and the research, and then you see if you can hear it in the performance, and maybe it changes something about the way you want to hear it as well. Yeah. That's a, that's a very beautiful, beautiful answer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it, it also strikes, I mean, I think you made a, a beautiful case for the connection between the raven and sad birds, but as you're suggesting, would you or have you considered using those those eight principles in the way you approach a different piece do you see it transferable in that sense i think for sure it made me very like it, it's growing on me that you know pose eight points it's pretty universal and i think it's quite transferable to a lot of a lot of um things like it, it i yeah the backbone of many so in the next piece i will definitely uh, attempt yeah, looking at We look forward to hearing that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have one more question here from uh, Yong and Wong again. Mm -hmm. It says, Hello, Zhang Ning. Is Ravel's dense forest a liberal application of the locale concept? Or did Poe specifically mean the composition must be texturally dense, occurring in small spaces? Okay, let me. I'll have a go at that. <laughs> Hi, Yongen. Um, shall, shall I read it again? Shall, shall, shall oh, no, I can, it's okay. I can. I can see the question. Yes. Oh, okay, good. How it has this technical wizardry <laughs> yes, that's happening you, here? I, we've got the screen. <laughs> oh, <very good. laughs> yes, thanks, Stephen. Um, so, in when Poe was talking about locale, and he, when he was thinking about the raven, the raven. Um, the whole poem happens in this uh, scholar's chamber. So what he meant by locale is that the location is very specific. Mm -hmm. And for example, you know, it, when you think about a frame, like a picture with a frame, the framing is very clear. Mm -hmm. It's like everything happens inside here. And I think it's because of how zoomed in it is it's not like in the middle, in, in one country and in this small town, in this forest, there is a house. It is literally like zoomed into, in this room, this is happening. So I think like how he says, you know, the locale having the force of a frame, I felt that that's very trans, that I, I found it very much applicable to Ravel's uh, Sabbaths because once I, started to think, okay, hmm, can I see it uh, in, through this lens as well? Then you start noticing how this, you know, the forest motif, the, the density and the darkness, it grounds everything. So to me, you know, in music, when sometimes, a lot of times, we struggle to pinpoint a sense of object, like where is this in the music? It feels very abstract. And sometimes it feels a little bit difficult to even want to try to assign like a sense of space when the composer doesn't write anything about it. I feel like in Ravel's music, it's, it, it, it has this very picture effect as well, like this is the forest, these are the birds. And so I think, yeah, I, I hope I answered the question <laughs> uh, sufficiently. But yeah, that's, that's just the sense of a location. It's, it feels specific and it feels like everything, the sadness, the motion, it's all bound within a space yeah yes 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 a lovely answer again again thank you i suppose uh, the, the one of the ways in which these two presentations complemented each other was uh ar around the idea of how a canonical work in this case ravel which is is mm -hmm. known can be illuminated from the inside and we can hear it afresh and that, that strikes me as absolutely the most essential thing that we as musicians need to do. It does raise that, that issue, though, that um, uh, Frances alluded to towards the end of her talk about canonicity mm -hmm. and challenging it. 
um, maybe if we could zoom back and just have some final comments um, along those lines. I mean, uh, the the canon has been uh, questioned for some time, of course, and there are all sorts of critiques of it. I suppose if one was to play devil's advocate, one might say that um, since the internet has made uh, a huge diversity of music available to everyone. I'm just wondering what you see as the, the, the burning issues of canonicity these days and how it perhaps has changed or what, what the emerging issues are for you in relation to this idea of canon. Mm. Would you like to have a go at, at that, Francis? Sure. Um, I'm not sure if they are particularly emerging ideas or that I'm just kind of keying into things that have been developed for a while, especially since mm -hmm. second wave feminism. But um, I think with regards to the internet and all the wonders that it brings, that it also brings the danger of kind of, I mean, as we've seen in many, many different ways in, in, in life, but that people get kind of pigeonholed or like pushed into certain things because of how many ratings they get, how many people like this video, right? And I think in some ways that that sometimes still reinforces the things that people generally think are great anyway, right? Like if someone is holding a music education class or something and they all go to YouTube and they all go to the same Beethoven Fifth video, not that there's anything wrong with Beethoven Fifth, but then that video automatically becomes more popular than Hensel's Opus 2 number one, right? Like, I mean, just these kinds of analytics and yeah, the algorithms just don't always favor lesser known things anyway. But yes, it is out there and it's definitely yeah. more accessible than it used to be, particularly when it comes to period performances, because they are so hard to like put on that they are so, I mean, not enough people are interested in them and then they're hard to put on and then it's hard to get access to the recording. But with things like Spotify or YouTube, like these things are so much more available. I think that I think that in the world of musicology, people are a lot more sensitive to how the canon is being formed. And yeah, you can see this in a lot of musical history textbooks. I mean, there's still a very long way to go, mm -hmm. but especially nowadays that people are um, especially attentive to the issues of race, right? That not just the female composers have been disregarded, but people who are not often, who are, who are not Caucasian have really been left aside in the Western canon for a very long time. And I think some good work is being done. There is still a long way to go. So I would say that that is a kind of, not that the issue of women composers is any less great, but that, that our sensitivity to including people of all ethnicities is, has been become very important as well. Mm -hmm. um, it has, there, there are a lot of different factors that play into what makes it into the canon and particularly what makes it into the repertory. But a lot of it has to do with challenging the idea of greatness and how people define what a great composer is, right? I mean, it's such a loaded term with so many issues to it. And that mm -hmm. if you have decreased visibility, as many female composers did, as many non-white composers did, then it really affects how people view you because they can't possibly view you as great if they can't see you at all. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that hopefully there are ways we can use the algorithms on the internet to promote the, the visibility of these people. And a lot of it happens more successfully when people who are already well, like performers who are already well known as performers decide to include these works in their performance repertory and people kind of borrow value from like if these, if these performers think that this is worth playing, then it must be worth listening to. So I will listen to it. And I mean, I wish the world would be more open to people who didn't have big names doing this, but that is just how it is sometimes. So. I'm not trying to directly answer your question, but that's kind of how I see canonicity playing out in yeah the music we hear now. No, I, th I think that that's a that's a beautifully broad uh, way, way way of seeing it. That it might in fact be a, a nice place to wind up this evening's presentation. Um, many thanks to you both. I thought they were wonderful in in as I say in complementary ways. And I look forward so much to seeing your your work down the track. So um, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all all of those watching. Thank you so much, and all the best to you both. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you for watching, and thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Yang. <laughs> thank you for watching.